Hey everybody, welcome back to Auto Anatomy. My name is Sean, thank you so much for joining us. Today is a big day. As you saw in the last video, we tore apart the Corvair engine, figured out exactly what was broken, and I'm really excited to show you, I kinda went a little crazy picking up some, uh, some new pieces for it. Today we're gonna to start the assembly process. The foundation is gonna be the engine block. And I've got the block on the, uh, the bench here. And the first step is, I've got it just roughly clean, but if you have ever taken apart a Corvair engine, there are little casting flashes and things like that all through here. And these are like razor blades. So, and some of these look like, I don't know if you're gonna be able to see this, um, like they're getting ready to just break off. So we're gonna start by deburring the block. Now this does absolutely nothing or relatively nothing for performance. Um, you know, smoothing some of these holes and like oil drainage passageways may help the oil drain back into the, the oil pan a little bit better. Not gonna really provide a whole lot more power. This is just to make sure that when I'm putting the engine back together that I don't slice my hand up. Now I've started deburring this one and you can see just got it rounded over just a little bit. We're also going to make some improvements to the oiling on the block based on the How to Hot Rod a Corvair book um, that came out I think in the 1960s and then there's a new, um, new one that's come out, a relatively new one. So we're going to enlarge these oil passages um, by about a sixteenth of an inch and then just clean everything up real well start the assembly process and then we get to put in some of our brand new parts i can't wait to get started on this build we'll go through and i'll tell you everything that we picked up for the corvair engine but let's start getting the block deburred so i forgot to show this in the last video but i just want to cut the oil filter open and take a look and see exactly what uh how good this wicks oil filter is Looking down at the bottom of the filter, there's a little bit of sparkle, but there's also a little bit of trash. Let's look in the filter itself. The filter's got a decent amount of trash in it, so I'm pretty sure that all of that junk down in the bottom of the pan got caught by the filter because this doesn't look, actually this looks really good because I'd be more worried if there wasn't any, any garbage in there, but you can see right down in there, there's, there's trash all in this filter. So the wicks did a good job of keeping the, uh, the engine from having really any more damage. Now we're going to start by deburring just some of the sharp edges of the block. Now we want to make sure that we're steering clear of the mating surfaces like these flanges where the block halves mate and as well as the cam bearing and crank surfaces. But otherwise we're just going to go through and pull out like all of that flash right there, round off some of these corners and sharp edges and just generally smooth this thing up and then we'll get on to making the oil modifications. All right, now that the, the rough deburring is done, I'm gonna go with a little bit finer grit uh, sanding roll and just to smooth out some of the, uh, the sanding marks. And then we'll go, to, I think this is 100, and then we'll go to like a, a 120, and then I'll be done with that part.
right, with the block all deburred and rinsed out, next we're gonna move on to making some modifications to the bearing oiling. Now, in the Performance Corvairs book by Seth Emerson and Bill Fisher, there is a chapter on, let me see if I can get to it. Yeah, on bearings and bearing modifications, where it talks about widening the main bearing oil supply grooves out to 3 16ths of an inch. And I've got some layout fluid on the main bearing um, side of the block and have scribed a total whip between the outside of the bearing groove this way to 3 16 So you can see it's just opening it up just a little bit. So we'll go ahead and take like a, a ball mill and just open that up just a little bit by hand, um, being careful not to impact the face where the bearing actually sits into this. So let me get a, a ball mill here and let's start uh, opening up these bearing surfaces. Okay, got all of the, the block modifications done. Got the bearing uh, oil surfaces widened out to 3 16ths. I found it was easier to actually just use a, uh, a small Dremel cutoff wheel to establish the line because that helped keep it straighter. And then come back with the ball mill to smooth it up and make it nice and, and pretty. All right, next step is I've got to wash this thing thoroughly, like probably a dozen times to get every trace of dirt, um, filings out of it, um, you know, not only from doing this, but from, from deburring the block, um, and then just cleaning it in general. So I've got a lot of work to do. Let me get this cleaned up, and then we will start the assembly process. Now that we've got the modifications to the block done, and the block is all clean, I spent um, a good bit of time going through it, cleaning out all the passageways, um, drying it, blowing it through with air, you know, getting it as clean as I can possibly get it. Now we're gonna turn our attention to the crank. On the last video, you saw that we uh, we mic'd the crank and measured all of the journals. Everything is within spec. We just need to do a little light polishing on it. So I've got a piece of crocus cloth here and we're just gonna wrap it around the, uh, the journals and lightly just polish every one of them. Then we'll clean this guy up and throw it back in the engine block. Before we get started, make sure you hit that subscribe button and click on the bell to be notified when new videos come out. It's an absolutely free way to help support our channel and I truly appreciate it. All right, let's get on with the build of this Corvair. The time's come, let's put this engine together. I've got my new bearings here. We'll drop it into the block, get those uh, lubricated and then put some assembly lube on the cam bearings. And what's different about this engine compared to most is that the, uh, the cam and crank timing marks are a little bit hidden. Now, most engines use, you've got the, uh, the crank gear and then a timing gear, and then you can actually see the two marks, whereas this one has got a mark on the camshaft and then like a little indention on the crank, and you just got to, to kind of line them up. Um, it's a little finicky, but once it's done, it's done. You don't ever have to worry about it moving again. Let me get some bearings on here, and then we'll drop the crank right back in place. With the crank dropped in the engine, now it's time to install the cam. Now I picked up this brand new cam from Clark's Corvair and it is a 270 cam. They said it's the one that is best suited for all around driving. And I went ahead and sprung to get the, uh, a new gear and to have the, uh, the fail safe gear installed. So these things apparently have a problem where the uh, the cam gear can come off at some point, and it wasn't on the uh, the old one, but apparently it isn't a, an issue. So I went ahead and, and sprung to get the, the fail-safe gear, so that way you'd never have to worry about this thing coming off. Now, if you look on the cam, yep, right there, hopefully you can see that, there is a zero mark on that tooth. Now, looking at the crankshaft, there is a tiny little indention right there. That is your zero mark. And it says in the manual to roughly line up this keyway at the three o'clock mark, which is it is, and then this is your mark to try and, and line that zero up with. So I'm gonna put some, uh, some bearing lube onto the, uh, the cam surfaces and gently kind of 
twist this, this camshaft down into the case. Wish me luck. Well, it took a couple of tries, but I finally got it uh, all timed up. Probably not gonna be able to see that, but there's a little timing mark right there, and then the zero on the cam. It's all lined up. I've got some assembly lube put on the other half of the cam. Now it's time to assembly lube the bearings on the other half of the crankcase and then drop the two halves together. Next up we've got to torque all of the, uh, the block halves together and it looks like it is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And the, the halves get torqued to 50 to 55 foot pounds so we're going to go right in the middle and do 52. Well, sadly, the, um, the cradle that I made to pull the engine out won't fit with the new oil pan. So I'm going to have to bolt the old oil pan on just to get the engine back in the car, then take this one off so that I can put the new one on. So we'll put the oil pan on just to keep any like debris out of the engine and then move it over to the stand. All right, next up, we've got a brand new set of oil pumps um, for this thing. And on the Corvair, you've got to shim the oil pumps. We're going to drop this in dry cut some strips of plastic gauge, bolt the, the top housing on, measure and see how much spacing there is to, uh, to the housing, to the gear itself, and then we can put the appropriate thickness gasket in place so that there's adequate clearance in place. So if you're not familiar with plastic gauge, it's a little plastic strip that when flattened out by pressure, um, the width of that, that flattened part can be used to measure the clearances with things. So we'll cut a few like quarter inch long strips, put them on top of the gears here, bolt the housing in place and see what kind of clearance we have. On the third try we got it, um, as you can see, this is slightly narrower than 0.02, but wider than 0.03, which is gonna be exactly within our clearance. So now we can pack some grease in here and then go ahead and torque this down for good. Now that we've basically got the, the short block assembled here, the next step is going to be assembling the, the pistons and rods and bolting them into the, uh, the block itself. Now I did splurge a little bit and went with some much higher quality rods and pistons than what originally came with it. 
For the jugs, we went through Clark's Corvair and got a full fin jug set. Now what I mean by that is, this is the original style where it, it had cutouts where the bolts go through. Now the early Corvairs, from my understanding, had fins all the way through and Clark's has got new manufactured full fin jugs that are notched for the little bit larger stroke on the crankshaft. The benefit of doing the, the full fin jugs is that a little bit better cooling and I guess in theory a little bit stronger since there's no break in the, uh, in the fins here. So it just keeps that rigidity a little bit uh, higher. For the pistons, I, I splurged a lot. Um, originally it came with a, a cast piston and we went with sealed power forged pistons with their uh, Duro Shield coating on the skirts. Main reason is I never want to have another piston failure in this engine ever. Um, the low friction coating on the skirts here will help with the hotter engine environment that the, the Corvair has being an air cooled. And then the rods are Clark's as well that are machined, lightened, um, new ARP studs in them. So these things should be pretty much bulletproof. So between all of the bottom end upgrades we've done, the new cam, new full fin jugs, new forge pistons, lightened, um, balanced rods with ARP studs, this thing should never have a bottom end failure ever again. So the next step is to start measuring end gap on the, uh, the piston rings. We'll drop them down in the bores, measure the end gap, make sure that it's within spec, and then start putting them on the pistons themselves and then putting the pistons and jugs together in the engine. First step here is to measure the end gap um, when the piston is finally you know, dropped down in the bore. The way that I do this, I've got the, the jugs all clean and we're gonna drop a ring down into the bore itself and then to make sure it's square, take a piston, push it down. That way it keeps the ring from cocking down in the bore. And the end gap, I don't know if you're gonna be able to see that, right there should be 13 to 25 thousandths according to the manual. So we'll take our, our feeler gauge and then just measure this gap, make sure that it's appropriate. If it's too small, then we can open it up just a little bit. If it's too big, there's nothing we can do. We've gotta get new rings. So our ring gap measured out to about 14 thousandths on, uh, on this one. Um, we'll have to do this for every single piston ring. Once we make sure that they're all within spec, we'll put them on the pistons and start assembling. Now that we've got the ring gap verified and the largest gap that we had was 18 thousandths, the smallest was 13 thousandths. We can put the rings onto the pistons and then put the pistons in the jugs and then finally bolt them onto the engine.
Now that we've got the heads on, um, they're not torqued down yet, but I've got to install the lifters first before I can put the bottom bolts in. Um, now I went ahead and went with the, the factory style deep dimple lifter on this. Um, I'm not sure it makes a whole lot of difference, but I've heard that this is the, the one that you want to use, so that's what we're putting in. Need to put a little lube on here and then we'll put these back in the bore. Got the engine all put back together pretty much with the exception of the flywheel. Now, many people have commented that need to do something about the riveted flywheel. Now on Corvairs, they had rivets holding the, the two bits of the flywheel together. And from what I understand, it's not a matter of if it will fail, but just when it will fail and start rattling. And unfortunately, the only way to fix it is to pull the engine out again. So I picked up this kit from Clark's where it has just some grade eight bolts and lock nuts. And essentially you just drill out one of the rivets at a time, put in the new lock nut, torque it to spec, and this should be a definitive fix. So I've got a special guest here helping me in the shop today. Dad has come all the way from Tennessee um, to help. So we're going to uh, get this drilled out, get all new bolts in it, and then hopefully get the engine back in the car today. All right, so looking at the instructions here, it says to drill out and replace one rivet at a time using a 5 16 drill. We're gonna center punch it, drill a small pilot hole, and then go through all the way to 5 16 With one hole completely drilled, the kit says to install the 5 16 bolt with the bolt in on the crankshaft side and then put the lock nut on and torque to 15 to 18 foot pounds. Just for my own peace of mind, we're gonna put some thread sealer or thread lock on there. Um, don't know that it's a necessity, but I don't wanna be doing this again. So we're just gonna, we're gonna do it. There it goes. All right, one down, 11 more to go. Dad and I got all of the, the rivets drilled out, all of it bolted in place and torqued, and hopefully this will be something that never have to worry about ever again. But that gets us to the point where now we're ready to install it onto the engine. So we've got our hardware cleaned up, got some thread sealant to put on the bolts because I think these actually go into um, an oil passageway. So if you don't put thread sealant on here, um, you could end up with an oil leak. So we'll make sure we put some thread sealant on here, get it torqued down, and then really we're just left to, to bolt the clutch on, put the transmission in, and then we're ready to put it in the car. Move this guy 
a little forward and jack this up please there you go it's coming together and just there it is all right so now that we've got the transmission and clutch all together i think there's only one thing left to do let's put the engine in the car We got the engine dropped in the car, went in pretty easily. Um, these things are just stupid easy how fast the, the engine goes in. Took Dad and I about 20 minutes to do. Still need to replace the, the oil pan with the new one we have and then bolt up, you know, just like some baffles and shields and things like that. Hook up the shifter linkage, the drive shafts, the throttle linkage, control arms, lots of little stuff. But uh, for the most part, the engine is back in the car and we are getting close to firing the engine's all back in the car now and we've buttoned up all of the the undercarriage things with one exception in a previous video we talked about wanting to replace the oil pan and really what drove this is that the original oil pan was warped and just kept leaking so picked this up from clark's corvair and this is like a half inch thick cast aluminum this sucker is not going to warp it's not going to leak Let's get it and the new pickup installed, and then we can finally put some oil in and see if this thing will build some oil pressure. This is where all of the assembly lube runs to. Oh, yes. As long as I'm standing here, you won't. They also say that with this pan, it's got the drain plugs were in the back of the, the engine, the back of the pan rather than the front. Mm -hmm. So, easier to change oil. Easier to change oil. You don't have to get under the car. Ah. You can just Take slide them. a pan under it and Take out the drain plug. pull out the drain plug. One last thing before we get ready to fire this thing up. Um, we've got some ZDP plus, ZDDP plus um, that restores ZDDP to, uh, to old engines. Basically, this is just a zinc additive, and we're going to put this in with every oil change just to make sure we don't have any wear on that brand new cam. Everything down below the car is all buttoned up. Oil pans in place. We're gonna put some oil in it and then manually prime this guy and see if we can get some oil pressure. Now the real question is can I pour oil in without pouring it everywhere? Everywhere. I got a couple of drops. Got a priming tool here. Let's see what happens. Look at there, almost 50 PSI oil pressure. Perfect. All right, oil pump's working. We've got oil. Um, let's stab a distributor in and see if this thing will fire. I think first we're gonna turn the car around so that the exhaust is facing out so we don't wake up the neighbors and everyone else. Actually, we might wanna wake up the neighbors. It's got power. Uh, it's got a little half fuel as soon as yeah we've got pump some up got oil pressure we've got distributor roughly set exactly all right well i think we're going to try and fire this thing up for the first time hopefully the battery's not dead
And of course the battery's dead. for about half an hour we're doing a little tuning on it i think we're going to change the oil next um, before we can drive it we still have to trim the baffles for the exhaust uh, for the headers um, put on some of the the lower panels you know a few other little things but it's darn close to being ready to drive and i can't wait yeah. it's going to be awfully hard to to not want to rip into it and actually have to behave for you know a couple of thousand miles yeah. Oh, we still need to put the uh, the little uh, seals on around the um, the engine tent. So there's a rubber oh, yeah, uh, accordion yeah. that goes all the way around. Yeah. Draining the oil out after the first run, and everything's coming out nice and clear. Um, don't see any metal on the magnetic pickup which is also a a bonus here or the magnetic drain plug so we'll put some new oil and new filter in it some more zddp and then i think that'll be good for probably a thousand miles or so and then we'll change it again okay first oil change is done we're going to put some more zddp back in for a little protection then i think we're ready to fire it back up again we got oil we got a filter no leaking. Yeah, let's fire it back up. I can't help myself, I can't wait. We have got to go take this thing for a spin. Um, yeah, it is gonna be a, uh, an exercise in self-control to not get on the throttle here, but we're gonna go take it for a spin. So we'll turn left up here. Turn left? Yes. Okay. So good. And 
That's a little like 185 tires and the original front shocks. No. Yes. <laughs> I have done absolutely nothing to the front suspension of this car. Other than putting in some like strut rod bushings, I have done zero oh, on the front end. Golly. So that is that is on the short list to do is upgrade the front suspension. And, oh, uh, but it's, it handles so good now. I know. God, I can't imagine what it's going to be like. And the fun thing stuff. is, <laughs> the hard works. The hard work. It's going to be awfully hard to get rid of this car, guys. So, um, sorry, Christy. I may end up keeping this one. So, it runs a little bit better now than it did last time you drove it. Runs better, shifts better. <laughs> Well, now that I got the engine running, at least somewhat, uh, at least good enough to drive, um, I really need to put the, the lower baffles and heat shields and thermostats and stuff like that in place. Um, one of those things that they really are beneficial for is generating enough heat to open the chokes. So running without them, at least I think so, in the short term, may uh, not allow the chokes to open up. So I don't want to wash the cylinder walls down with fuel. So let's get on to um, installing the, the lower heat shields and thermostats. Now, if you look at the instructions on Clark's Ultimate Exhaust page, um, it says that you basically have to take the lower baffle and cut it and then put them in as two pieces and then kind of join them together with some, some like little separation plates. They do include templates that once you cut it, you can like line it up and then Let's see, this is air outlet end. Something like this. Anyway, it goes like this roughly, and you trace out the little um, cutouts, and that provides room for the headers to come out. We're going to make a line three and seven eighths inches from the oil pan side, so from this side, in, draw a straight line, cut it, then it says to bolt the oil pan side on first and that'll include the uh, the thermostat that opens the baffle door so we'll make our line um, cut the two pieces out um, bolt the oil pan side on first and then put our little template on here make our little cutouts and hopefully bolt this thing on where it fits up nice and tight um, and doesn't allow too much air to escape past the holes here because the more air that comes out here the less uh, heat that you're going to have in the winter time so let's mark our lines and go ahead and get started cutting on the baffles and then we'll get this thing installed do a little bit more tuning and finally take it on a good long road drive With the shield cut in half, um, now it's time to take our template here. So we'll just align it to the edge here and clamp it or tape it, and then mark our cutouts for the exhaust pipes. Cut this thing out, test fit it, squirt a little coat of paint on it, and then hopefully this part will be done. And then there's not really a whole lot left to do.
All right, so we got it all back together. Um, I think we're ready to go take it on a good long test drive. Let's see if she'll fire up. All right, here we go. Again, the first thing I notice is it's pretty loud. Um, I did take a look inside the muffler and I need to reach out to Clarks about this because it looks like whoever built the exhaust for Clarks may have welded in the mufflers backwards. Um, it's got glass pack type mufflers that have like a little louver in them. And all of the louvers, the opening is facing the outlet of the muffler. And if I remember correct, they're supposed to face the inlet so that it captures those exhaust gases and diverts them into the fiberglass packing. Second thing I notice is that the new cam definitely has a little bit less bottom end torque than the old cam did. Um, I'm not surprised. It's got a lot more duration and a lot more lift. Um, so you sacrifice a little bit of bottom end for a whole lot more top end. That being said, I have yet to actually get on this thing because I'm going to try and behave for at least 500 to 1,000 miles just so that we can break this engine in right. We spent a lot of time, a lot of money to make sure this engine works well and we don't want to sacrifice it by doing something stupid. All in all, I'm really pleased with the way that this has turned out. It's got great compression across all six cylinders. It cranks up and runs well. It still needs a little tuning, and that's just going to take some time for me to work out. Um, probably the jetting isn't right for the new engine, but we'll work on that. Coming up on the Corvair project, we've got some brake system upgrades that you have been asking for. That'll probably be the next video. We also want to go through and do some suspension improvements. Um, we're going to do some rust repair in the front end, and we're going to start taking this thing to some cars and coffee events here in South Carolina. So if you're in the Green Glary and want to see the car, um, I will be heading out to some of the cars and coffee events on Saturday mornings. I know they do a, a big one at the BMW plant there in, uh, in Greer. But in the meantime, I'm just gonna enjoy ripping on this little thing for a while, putting some miles in it, and having a huge smile on my face. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this kind of stuff, make sure you click on that subscribe button and hit the bell to be notified when new videos come out. Thank you again. God bless you all. We will see you next time.